Alouin. This is Alouin cap. Yeah. And I know a lot of beekeepers are very um, anxious to hear about the results. Very, very anxious, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. This is a good product. It's a good. Yeah, so this is a study we did last year mm-hmm. um, in our case with your colonies, Bob. And then this was in collaboration with and replicated in um, Alabama at Auburn University in Jeff Williams' lab with his current graduate student, Dan Orell, there. And then also replicated up at um, USDA Beltsville in Steve Cook's lab there. So we did this in three different sites. Um, in our case, with your colonies in Beltsville and Alabama with uh, scientific research colonies. And this was testing the, uh, the product that's been developed kind of out of Argentina and a couple of other places that are cellulose, cardboard, essentially, strips with oxalic acid, glycerol or glycerin um, suspensions mm-hmm. on them. So a, a slow release oxalic acid, as you might call it. Yeah. So this is this material is kind of what fueled Randy Oliver's uh, research looking into the vegetable glycerin mm-hmm. oxalic acid applications that, that he's been writing about for years. We wanted to test this because it's already a product it uh, is it it's beekeeper friendly you're not making this product in your kitchen or bathroom or wherever uh, and it could possibly get USDA EPA approval mm-hmm. and be approved in the United States for use by beekeepers so all of us um, Stephen and Jeff and Dan and Lewis and myself um, really thought that this is kind of the approach we need to do as opposed to keep going down the same road with the homemade oxalic acid vegetable glycerin product because no one is going to make that product because it costs so much, one, to get something approved yeah. and to get it governmental approval. And we're talking millions, and we just don't see a company like Day Dant or Man Lake spending that kind of money to make the product available for beekeepers because they're not going to get, a, they're not going to make their money back. It would take them, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an economic person, but it would take a long time, if ever. It's being yeah. recorded. Okay, got it. Well, I appreciate you doing this, Dan. These graphs that you were showing me earlier look pretty cool. I think a lot of people are going to be looking forward to this information. I've gotten a lot of comments on my channel. People are, people are anxious to see what the results of all this were. And most folks just think that it's mostly a UGA thing. And I want to make it crystal clear here that you were a huge part of this and that um, UGA was collaborating with with uh, universe, Auburn University and uh, I guess the Beltsville lab or who, who in Maryland is the other third of this? So the, the three labs were uh, the Auburn University B lab, the University of Georgia B Lab, and then Steve Cook's group at uh, the USDA Beltsville. Okay, great. We had all, uh, more is better in a situation like this. Yeah. Well, especially especially when just testing a product in one location really yeah. only gives you a single. A, it really testing it in a single setting. So testing it in three locations is, I think, worthwhile. Yeah. Well, so what, can, what do you got? What do you got? Well, I, I'll just start with a few introductory slides to catch. Uh, everyone up to speed. Okay. Of course, Varroa destructor is a huge problem for Apis mellifera colonies, especially in temperate regions, even though bees in, uh, in the tropics uh, can handle Varroa a lot better. And one of the big issues is that the Varroa might reproduce in the cap brood cells, as you know, and when they're in those cap brood cells, they're protected from a lot of the treatments that we use, including oxalic acid, which we were testing here. So the treatment options are limited by things like miticide resistance, high temperatures, cross a few of the more volatile treatments off of the list. And as well, when honey supers are on the hives, that means that some of the treatments are not appropriate to use. And then like, like I was just talking about the presence of brood physically protects the mites that are in the brood cells. Uh, so to continue the introduction, sort of the reason why we thought the testing alone cap was worthwhile 
is that by being an extended release oxalic acid treatment, it could essentially persist at levels in the hive that would extend beyond the 12 or so days that the varroa mites are inside capped worker cells. So then when the mites emerge from the cells that they developed in, they would receive a dose of oxalic acid. And other work had shown that it is potentially a viable summer treatment. And this was in, uh, I believe, Mexico and, and Argentina, the, the two previous studies I'm aware of. Uh, and the companies were interested in registering these oxalic acid strips in the US. So there might be a somewhat straightforward path to actually getting it in the hands of beekeepers in the US. Just to talk a little bit about like the broad strokes of this trial, like I said, we replicated it at one site in Alabama, one site in Maryland, and another site in Georgia, which of course was your location. And in all the three locations, it took place during the summer after the main honey flow was over. So in Alabama and Maryland, we tested three treatments. So an untreated control where the hives got nothing, an aloe and cap treatment where they got this test treatment. And we used a dosage of four aloe and cap strips, which is what the producer is currently putting on their label in Argentina. And it's a cellulose strip that contains oxalic acid dissolved in glycerin. And you take these long strips and you fold them over the brood frames. And I was and surprised at how large the strips were. That uh, surprised me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess they're, they're long enough that they basically hang down on both sides of the frame, um, almost, the, almost the full depth of the frame. Eh? Yeah. And in, uh, in Alabama and Maryland, we also used a positive control apivar. But in Georgia, you had just the two treatments, untreated versus mm -hmm. the aloe cap strips. Mainly we were looking to evaluate the effects on colonies and on varroa. So some of the primary measurements that we took were varroa infestation of adult bees. And we estimated the coverage on the frames of the bee population, as well as how much capped brood there was. And then we also took samples of honey just from the periphery of the brood nest. So in the same brood boxes that these treatments were applied in and later tested those for oxalic acid residues. So first we'll look at the results overall, like with all three regions combined, just to get a, a general overview. And then we can look at an individual graph for each of the three states. Pink line is the control line. Hi. Blue is aloe and cap and yellow is apivar. And you can see the, the varroa levels started around two and a half to 3% on average. Mm -hmm. And then in the control group, they ended at 10.3% uh, overall. And in the test treatment, the aloe and cap group, they ended at 4.6%. So e even, even though the test treatment really was aloe and cap, this does, this does you know, sort of as a, as a side effect, uh, also gives us a bit of a look at how apivar is working. Yeah. So overall, like on day 42, there was a statistically significant difference between uh, the varroa levels in the control group and the and the aloe and cap group, there were ab about half as many mites in the treated group uh, on day 42, like at the end of the trial. We would have loved to see this blue line going down to zero or going down to one or two percent, but actually overall the varroa levels increased a little bit. So I know you you were talking to Lewis earlier and he was making the distinction between maintenance treatments and curative treatments. Mm -hmm. If we'd seen a, a good reduction in mite levels from day zero to day 42, that would indicate that it's a curative treatment that you can take moderate or high mite levels and bring them down. But so really what we saw was that aloe and cap slowed the increase in mite levels significantly but we didn't see that kind of curative effect that, that Lewis was talking about where you'd... So Alabama is actually the location where we had um, you know, the, the least benefit from aloe and cap, where the aloe and cap, uh, the control group ended at about a 10% mite level and the aloe and cap group ended at 
about seven and a half percent. Can you tell me what date this started in Alabama? I would have to take a look for that, um, but it would have been sometime in July that it began. July, okay. Ours started in August, okay. Mm-hmm. And That's then right. what, what date did Beltsville start? <clears throat> it was around the same time. We, we weren't staggered by, we were staggered just by a few weeks, if I, rem- if I remember right. Um, in Maryland, at the end of the trial, there was a significant difference, uh, you know, 2% versus uh, you know, pushing 6%. But again, we saw a modest increase in mite levels from day zero to day 42. And then finally, we've got the data from Georgia, where, which is the, the one region of the three where the aluminum cap mite levels stayed uh, constant through the trial. Okay, so have you and Jeff uh, talked about why this happened differently? I mean, what, what's going on, you think? Within, uh, well, at each location, there are going to be a hundred different things that are a little bit different. So, for example, the the weather through during the forty two day trial was different in Georgia and Maryland and Alabama. The humidity, for example, the temperature. We also would have had slightly different bee populations potentially and brood populations for sure. And I can show you a graph. So mainly we were looking at, we were uh, estimating the bee strength and brood strength of the colonies to pick up any negative safety effects, like Mm -hmm. harmful effects on the colonies. And both when we looked at bee population and worker brood area, what would have been a concern is if the blue line, the aluminum cap line, for example, ended the trial consistently with low bee populations, like if the blue line always ended low. What type of bees did they have in Maryland? And then what type of bees did you have in Alabama? So for sure in Alabama, I would characterize ours as Italian type bees. Okay. I believe Maryland uh, would have had similar, yeah, essentially all, also Italian type bees, but I would have to mm-hmm. confirm that. Um, well, and how about, how about your? Were our, ours were mainly Caucasian and Carniolan with just a little bit of Italian in them. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure that that means anything in, in this test, but uh, you can see how our bees, bee numbers were headed down fast in August, which is typical of that type of, of race. Uh, mm-hmm. Once the honey, once the pollen starts uh, receding, which in our neighborhood about the 1st of July, it really starts to slow down. A month later, you see this decreased bee population. And that really shows up right here in this graph. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like maybe in Alabama, you might have had a little bit of pollen through the middle of that because you had increased bee numbers and frames of bees. Mm -hmm. Bees were stimulated by something. And then frames of cap brood. Um, Well, this is interesting. So in Georgia, it looks like the capped brood really didn't fall off like the numbers of bees. That's a, of course, mm-hmm. capped brood was already low too. Yeah. Very That's right. So, so your somewhat lower frames of capped brood at the start of the trial could, well, w- probably would have contributed to the you know, yeah. decline in the colony populations. Yeah, very interesting. And, and that, that, that would honestly probably be my first guess as to why the treatment seemed to work a little bit better in in these bees in Georgia. Just that uh, in Alabama, like if you if you just roughly draw an average amount of sealed brood mm-hmm. on this graph, it'd be about two and a half frames of brood. And same for Maryland, even though it changed it changed through the trial. But you were your bees were sitting a little, a little closer to two. Yeah. And perhaps when you when you have lower brood areas, but uh, high or a little bit higher bee populations, then more of the mites are actually gonna be on the adult bees. I will also show you the oxalic acid residue data. Okay. And then we can sort of wrap this up by talking about sort of your, well, I wanna hear about your impressions from your looking at those bees as, as well as sort of when you 
take that experience of looking at the bees and also compare that to uh, what you're seeing, what the numbers you're seeing on these graphs. Okay. Um, but yeah, so looking at the oxalic acid residues, which we tested in Alabama and Maryland, um, let me think. So in, in one of these two regions, there was a difference in the post-treatment levels of oxalic acid residues. So in Alabama, on day 42, the aloe and cap treated colonies had a little bit higher oxalic acid levels than the control colonies. And the difference with, uh, we saw a similar difference as well in Maryland, where the aloe and cap ended a little higher than the control colonies. Um, but just to put this into context, like the, the oxalate levels that were, that we measured, uh, the, like the, the highest average level was about 100 ppm. Mm -hmm. And honey naturally contains uh, actually a much wider range of oxalic acid residues, up, up to 800 parts per million. So moderately effective, 55%. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> And uh, this Henderson-Tilton calculation is to essentially adjust for the fact that the varroa levels were a little bit different at the beginning. When mm -hmm. you take that into account, then you're looking at about 65% efficacy. I guess, you know, for me as a beekeeper, uh, the money, the price would be a, a big part of whether I would decide to use something like this. I could see using something like this early in the year when your mite levels were low like perhaps before or at the beginning when you put your honey supers on and you need mm -hmm. something to just kind of keep those levels under control and not, you know, just go through the roof before you can get your supers off in, you know, late July or August, it could be useful for something like that. Um, you know, a lot of people are using it for, or looking at formic acid and different ways of using oxalic acid as a organic, somewhat non-toxic, toxic, uh, compound in order to uh, keep things under control until they can get around to really doing a a real control, you know, in August when it's so critical. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, and, and this, you know, I wonder how this stuff would work when the bees were broodless too. You know, in winter, it could be a really real possibility uh, when the bees are broodless for us in late November and early December. So I'd be very curious about, uh, do you guys plan on doing any study about that or so it's something that i'm i'm interested in I, I agree with you especially given that that in your region where there was a little bit less brood this product seemed to work a little bit better at the at the dose uh -huh. that we tested so that's a that's a little indication a little hint that what you're talking about might really be worth looking at like testing a product like this at a time when the brood area is a lot lower I can't get my hands on this product, but uh, I'd be even tempted to do it myself if I could get some, you know, take 20 colonies and do it and 20 colonies and don't. And just, I know that's not, that's just me. I'm not a scientist. And, but uh, most beekeepers through casual observation can figure things like this out. I wouldn't mind trying it just to see what it does when the bees are broodless if you guys mm -hmm. don't uh, do that yourselves. Uh, we're going to be running a trial in th this spring, testing different options for a different sort of low brood period. Some days after you start a colony with a queen cell, you have a dip in the, yeah. in the brood yeah. area. Uh, yeah. Randy Oliver's written about that. Um, yeah. So we're, we're gonna be replicating one of his experiments on a bit of a bigger scale and testing more different treatment options. Um, I, don't, I don't think Alan Cap is gonna be one of our treatment options in that trial. Um, but that's another low brood time of year where an extended OA product, uh, yeah, we're looking at, like you're saying. Well, I can't think of any other questions. I'll probably think of lots of questions when we sign off here. Uh, but, uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you were pretty busy today and this was probably the last thing you wanted to get involved with. No, absolutely not. We've, we've had this on the schedule for a few days. So it's, uh, okay. it's nice to, nice to catch up and, and talk it over yeah. again. All right. Well, thank you very much.